I'm very pleased to be joined by New York One political director, a City Hall veteran. Welcome to Citywide. Thanks for having me, Ken. There seems to be a lot of political news these days between uh, from Spitzer to Patterson, from uh, Clinton to Gillibrand, uh, from Bloomberg, the lame duck, to Bloomberg, the, the candidate. But a lot of it seems to be soap opera and not substance. So what's your overall take on the New York political scene? Well, I, you're right. I mean, part of it is that New Yorkers love a story. They do love the soap opera. And reporters and New Yorkers sometimes f miss the substance for, for the style. Uh, and the problem often is that the lar some of these people are larger than life. Ed, look at Ed Koch. Uh, clearly part of his appeal was that he had this larger-than-life personality. The current mayor, though, he's liked by New Yorkers almost because he's not that larger-than-life character. He's not this cartoon character. He's more of the guy behind the scenes who can do your taxes, make sure the city's budget is balanced, and move, the, move on. Uh, but people like Elliot Spitzer, a little bit larger than life, again, you, you see that. Now uh, his successor, David Patterson, not not that kind of cartoon character, kind of a guy that we're still trying to figure out. So there's a balance. I think New Yorkers love that kind of uh, person who it's more about style than substance, but then they get sick of that, and then they retreat to something else. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing right now, why Bloomberg has done so well. He's not the prototypical New York politician. One of the things about um, uh, how candidates get stature in New York, obviously the more attention they get, the more attention they get. but. Picking a fight with the mayor, standing up to the mayor is traditionally a way to, to elevate yourself. But um, just as good as that is when the mayor picks a fight with you or fi fights back. Rudy Giuliani was famous for elevating his critics in that way. Mike Bloomberg seems not to fight with people. And it seems it's a lot harder for anybody to get, uh, get your attention because um, they can hold whatever press conference and make whatever claims they want. And if he ignores them, they're less likely to get any play. You're absolutely right. Bloomberg does not like to do that. The, the Brooklyn Museum of Art that Rudy Giuliani took on uh, was a great example of what you're talking Which about. They cut their funding because he didn't like their exhibit. Right. They had, they had some very controversial pieces of art. Uh, I think Elephant Dung and the Virgin Mary was uh, one of the famous or infamous paintings. And so it became this long protracted thing that Giuliani did. And it was a great it was a great method for fundraising at the time. This is the kind of thing that Bloomberg doesn't like. Uh, which benefits him sometimes with the media and hurts him other times. It benefits him because he doesn't get into a three-day back and forth with someone about some small issue. But sometimes it could benefit him to get attention that he needs by taking people on. So it's a double-edged sword with him. But I think the reason why his popularity has lasted as long as it has is because people aren't sick of him saying, oh, he's railing, there the mayor goes again, he's going off again. And that's why he's able to last as long as he has. Daniel Patrick Moynihan, a very substantive great senator of New York, you never would have heard I'm talking about the Brooklyn Museum of Art. And I think, again, that's why New Yorkers liked him and why he la lasted for uh, 20, uh, 26 years. There's been some erosion in Bloomberg's popularity, uh, hugely over the term limits fight, but also uh, some sense that he doesn't seem to appreciate the impact that some of these political developments have on average people. Yeah, I, it's very odd that the mayor is still sometimes tone deaf about certain things that he says. He recently said on his radio show, uh, I love the rich. And while you might love the rich privately because they are paying taxes, that's the, one of the dumbest anti-populist messages you can make. And he's still a little tone deaf. I remember when the, remember when the first uh, transit strike uh, didn't happen, but it was going to happen, and he went out and he bought a bike, but not any bike. Right, he bought an expensive bike. Exactly. And so he still has that in him, that he'll, he'll talk to people when he was first campaigning in uh, 2001, he said to someone in Brooklyn, oh, yeah, a friend of mine, oh, he owns the Jets. These are not the, the right things to say as a politician. While he's learned a lot, he still sometimes makes those mistakes. So handicapped the race. He's an incumbent mayor. His popularity has dropped, but it's still above 50 percent. Um, he was a Republican, a Democrat, an independent, it's hard to say politically, uh, and he's got all of that money to spend on a campaign. Is he, is he unbeatable? He's not unbeatable, but he is very tough to beat. Uh, and part of the reason is that the big issue that we're all hearing about is the economy. That The economy to Bloomberg is what 9-11 and security was to Giuliani, crime. People don't want to go to City Comptroller Bill Thompson or Anthony Weiner uh, as readily as they are to run to the incumbent mayor, who's a businessman, when the issue is the economy. And so that's the that's the two of the the, the that's the biggest problem really for either one of them. Is, is that in 
intuitive, or are you seeing that in your polling? Both. Uh, we, we did a poll uh, about a month ago, so the economy was the number one issue, and, and, and New Yorkers are asked, well, who do you trust with the economy? Overwhelmingly. So some people think, oh, if the economy's not going well, if there's budget cuts, people aren't going to like the messenger, who the messenger is the mayor. I tend to think they, they feel more secure. It's almost like life during wartime. You want to stay with the president during wartime, nine times out of ten. It's the same thing I think we're going to be seeing with the economy right now. And where do you see the Wiener and Thompson campaigns vis-a-vis -vis each other and becoming the Democratic nominee? That, that's a great question. Usually, we, we know the Democratic Party very well. Uh, they, they like to attack each other, typically candidates in a primary. Thompson and Wiener have been very good about not attacking each other so far. There's also a lot of speculation that Wiener may not be in this through September when the primary starts. Thompson has been focusing all of his attentions on the mayor. Wiener has been more focusing his attentions on his constituents going to these town hall meetings. It's a different Wiener than we heard before. We used to hear the, we used to hear the Anthony Wiener going the after the mayor, Anthony, the angry Anthony, Anthony Wiener, right. or the funny Anthony Wiener, but, but going after the mayor a lot, and we're not hearing that as much. If this keeps up, uh, although Thompson would like we need to be focusing his attentions on the mayor, this is good for the Democrats because we're going to be hearing relentlessly over several months negative things about about uh, the mayor uh, and as opposed to negative things about the Democrats. As you and I have seen in many, many primaries that have been very self-destructive uh, for the Democrats. They have to avoid that if they want to beat him. Governor Patterson, um, distinguished political family, uh, a political accomplishment of his own. He took out the incumbent minority leader of the state Senate, uh, got himself into that position, gave up that what would now be the number three position in the state to become the who knows what number right. you'd call the lieutenant governor, and then he winds up as the, as the governor. Seems to have had a rocky year. Um, is that David Patterson, or is it just circumstances uh, caught up in the whirlwind? It's a little bit of both. He's a very enigmatic man, uh, David Patterson. He, some people would think, oh, he's just a clubhouse politician from Harlem. That could be nothing could be further from, from the case. A very interesting guy, legally blind. His family moved him to Long Island growing up. He went to Columbia, went to law school. Still can't read Braille. Has an amazing memory, amazing capacity for facts. Also known by a lot of people as not always disciplined. And we've seen that lack of discipline. When he first became governor, he was thrust upon him. It was a very rocky couple of weeks talking about uh, his marriage, talking about past drug use. But I think over that course of, of that summer, he picked up some steam. And actually, he was kind of the canary in the coal mine about the economy. Very early on the economy. It impressed a lot of people right. with that. So people said, hey, this guy, maybe, you know, maybe he's picking up steam. And what does he do? He does not handle a scandal involving his chief of staff very well. His, uh, Charles O'Byrne did not pay his taxes. Uh, this was kind of, he was twisting in the wind for a very long time. Uh, and, and then on top of that, the Senate selection for the replacement of Hillary Clinton, which was, I think we would all agree was pretty disastrous. What it's happened the there? I don't know exactly what happened. I mean, that's a great question. How, how you know, it looked like that Caroline Kennedy was the one, the anointed one, and then supposedly she was told by the Patterson people, we're not sure if we're definitely picking you. And then there was, uh, my belief was that she said, if you're, eh, thanks, but no thanks. And then the Patterson people had, had a lot of negative things to say behind the scenes about her, which to me was extraneous. At that point, she's out of the picture. So it looked, it looked like amateur hour because it was. So the question is, can the governor now recover from all that? We're, we're in the middle of the budget season right now and pick things up. He has about a, a little bit more than a year. I just don't know which David Patterson we're going to see over that year. He could be the disciplined one or the one who was least learning discipline or the one who was all over the map. Now, I understand that you're an analyst and not an operative. But we have a new United States Senator, uh, Kirsten Gillibrand, uh, only been in office a short time uh, as a member of Congress, upstate uh, district, uh, came in under awkward circumstances at, at best. If you were um, to advise her on what she needs to do to become known to New Yorkers and to make herself of interest to your viewers, what would you say to her? Well, I think she was smart. On her very first weekend, she came down to New York City. She met with Al Sharpton. She went to Southeast Queens, uh, African-American uh, section of Queens, mm -hmm. and really went to neighborhoods that no one had ever heard uh, of her before. Part of the problem for her now is that she actually has to work which means being, spending a lot of time in Washington and not a lot of time in New York City. But what I would tell her to do is every spare moment you have, come to the five boroughs because any, any primary that could happen a year from now in September is probably, the person's going to probably come from the five boroughs. Uh, Manhattan Borough President Scott Stringer has talked about right. possibly running. Uh, the, the, all the votes in the primary, typically statewide, are almost all concentrated here. So she needs to spend a lot of time in New York City uh, over the next year. If she were back in her district as a member of Congress, if, 
if she do, showed up in, in Albany or Poughkeepsie uh, for something, it's news because a member of Congress uh, has shown up. Now, if she shows up in New York City now uh, and marches in a parade or speaks to a community group, will that make it onto New York one? No, you're absolutely right. She can't just show up. Uh, Woody Allen once said, I think, 80 percent of success is showing up. In New York politics, it might be 40 percent of success is showing up. Chuck Schumer always had something, something on a Sunday to say, something that he knows that the tabloids in New York one will seize upon. She needs to do that, too. Hey, I'm not going to just go to the church group. I mean, that's helpful. But th I'm going to say something after the church to the media, and it's going to be, be a big splash. And she's learning. I, listen, she's a very bright woman. She's from a heavily Republican district when she entered Congress. She was able to beat John Sweeney, uh, who's an entrenched incumbent, who had some scandal problems of right. his own, but she still managed to beat she him. She took advantage of She took of advantage it. of it and beat him. So she's no dummy. So I think people who are writing her off right now, I think, uh, are, are going to learn that uh, she's going to be pretty tough, I think, next year if she does get a uh, primary challenge. Citywide will continue our conversation with Bob Hart right after this. Welcome back to Citywide. We're talking politics with Bob Hart from New York One. Before the break, we were talking about our new senator, uh, uh, Kirsten Gillibrand, and the possibility of her getting a uh, primary contest next year. It occurred to me that one potential candidate who on paper would seem ideal uh, to go against her was the former public advocate, Mark Green. He had won citywide primaries for mayor. He had run for the U.S. Senate. He had a national liberal constituency, a lot of name recognition. But instead, he's running for re-election to his old job as public advocate. What's, what's going on there? A lot of people think that Mark Green has a bigger goal in mind if, if he becomes public advocate again, that he's doing some math right now. And he's figuring, hey, I can win my old job back. And I have to say, I would agree with him. He can. He's the front runner. Then he does the math and says, listen, if Mike Bloomberg can be taken out of his word, he's only going to do this for another four years. And he is, I think, in the back of his mind, thinking once again for running for City Hall. I, that, that, that has to be what it is. Uh, the Senate, he twice ran for the Senate and lost. And I think he's, I think he's just had it. Uh, with, that, with that race. He's been twice bitten by that. But I really do think that the city hall is in the back of Mark Green's mind. So do the view the voters look at him and say he's uh, sully uh, in a time of crisis? Uh, you want to go with the with the with the gray hair? Uh, or do they say that has been? I, I thought we got rid of him with term limits. Well, it's a little bit of both. And the thing is, in a crowded primary, that might be enough to get Mark Green to the top of the pack or second. Uh, you need 40 percent to avoid a runoff. I don't know if you'd get that 40 percent, but there's there's five or six other, uh, four or five other candidates. So if he, you know, I, I can't imagine a scenario where he isn't in the top two. It'd be very, very hard for him. So while some voters will have the, the Mark Green fatigue, enough will say, hey, I like this guy. I know his name, which you can't say with all the I other pulled candidates. The lever for I him pulled the lever for, for him before. And so I think he's, he's banking on that. And I think that's a fair thing to bank on. So I know it's a long time off until the primary. A lot will change. But of the large field uh, that's out there right now, who would you say the candidates are that we should be watching? Well, Eric Joya, uh, obviously, uh, is very strong. Uh, city councilman from Queens. Bill de Blasio Tell me from why Brooklyn. He, uh, finish sure. the list, and then I want to ask you a question about that. I don't even know if I can, I can, I can remember yeah. everyone on the list. Right. You might have to help me. Norman Siegel, the civil, uh, uh, civil liberties attorney who's run twice right. before. Jessica Lappin, possibly. Jessica Lappin. Okay. Uh, so, John Liu, possibly, though. We're hearing rumblings now that that, that may change. So. so all of those city council members, right. they've all been in office around the same amount of time. They've raised large, you know, similar amounts of money. Um, none of them are super well known. So what makes one of them the front runner or more of a front runner than the others at this stage of the game? Well, that's the problem. They're all relatively well, well known in their, in their communities, but not outside of that. They do press conferences every week. They, they'll, they're known by their colleagues in the city council, but they aren't necessarily uh, are by voters. They're going to have to try to figure something out this, this summer to distinguish themselves. That's why Mark Green is thinking, ha ha, I can swoop in right. and steal this away from all of you. I want to turn a little bit to the coverage of political news and, and 
one of the things that occurred to me is that is that over the last couple of elections and with the growth of national cable news networks, there's been almost a what I call a nationalization of 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 news and political activism. Uh, one day I got into a conversation with somebody on a subway train, uh, African American gentleman, working class guy from uh, from Queens. He watched CNN every morning. He knew Joe Biden's position when Biden was a senator on many different issues. He didn't know the name of his congressman, Greg Meeks, who represented him in his district. And he wasn't particularly interested in anything in New York City. He just wanted to know what was going on in the country. I would think now, with the heightened interest after the Obama election, the national uh, the financial meltdown, does anybody even care who the public advocate is? You know, you look at, at the voting patterns in, in New York City and you think, oh, Giuliani Dinkins, the turnout must have been tremendous for those elections. And then you compare it to, say, Clinton Dole and the presidential races blow that off the map. Tip O'Neill once said all politics is local politics. I'm not quite sure if that's really true. I know many, many people who live across the five boroughs who can't name their assemblyman or assemblywoman and yet could name, name all the powerful people in Congress. And that, that's upsetting to me as a journalist and as a New Yorker. So... What's the impact of the election of Obama on local politics, both in terms of, you know, uh, people who might have stars have, have moved up, Adolfo Carrion, Bronx Borough President, moved to the White House. That's an obvious example. But has, has the Obama phenomena changed the way people at the grassroots level engage in politics in New York? I think we're still learning about that. There is no firm answer yet. There's definitely some New York politicians and, and New York activists who bucked the trend, who said, you know what, I'm not going with our local woman, Hillary Clinton, our hometown girl, and I'm going with Obama, which was very interesting. That was a risky, very risky decision by some of these people, and it, it paid off. So I don't know if this grassroots movement that we did see a little bit on the New York level, if that's going to flourish uh, throughout the municipal elections this year, or, that, or if it was just a trend? I just don't know yet. Let me ask you a corollary of that. In the last few years, there have been any number of quite powerful uh, elected officials. I'm not talking about Spitzer, or, or, but, but starting with Alan Hevesy, the state controller who was uh, forced to plead guilty to using the car uh, to take his wife around. But I'm talking about people like the county leader of Brooklyn, Clarence Norman, uh, numerous members of the state legislature. Brian McLaughlin, the former head of the Central Labor Council, was an assemblyman, engaged in corruption uh, activities, convicted for it. Uh, Joe Bruno, uh, the uh, uh, Senate Majority Leader, retired uh, under indictment. Judges uh, in various counties uh, going to jail. It doesn't seem to be any sense of outrage. It's sort of like people just sort of assume that because they, they assume all the politicians are corrupt, so when they get actually get arrested, they don't care. I think some of it also is getting back to what you were talking about originally. A lot of New Yorkers are so busy with their lives or following national politics, they don't always focus on some of the things locally. I used to always think that a lot of the reason why the shenanigans seemed worse in Albany than here in New York City was it was 150 miles north of here, and there was a little bit of insulation going on. And I think that's also just in terms of interest that some people have in local news, that if it were the president or if it was someone high up in the president's cabinet, there would be that outrage. New Yorkers aren't just, it's not like Louisiana where we say, oh, that's how people are. I don't think people are always aware of what's going on. Well, is there a reform movement in New York anymore? You've got what I'd call the professional advocates from some of the civic organizations that will decry lobbying or call for campaign finance reform or whatever, but it, it's almost like a kabuki play. The, a scandal erupts, you go to the usual sources, they call for reform, the next day uh, the public pays attention. There's no reform political clubs, there's no Eleanor Roosevelt organizing, you know, the intellectuals of New York. There aren't even very many newspaper reporters that write about this stuff anymore. The big wave I think we last saw where, where there was that talk was in, in the wake of the municipal scandals in the, in the Koch administration when suddenly the, the New York City Campaign Finance Board uh, came about, that there was an interest uh, that I think did wake people up when you had Donald Manis, the uh, borough uh, uh, president, uh, uh, the, the, the Queen's Democratic leader uh, killing himself, uh, you know, it has to take something like that for, for someone to wake up and say, hey, let, let's, you know, what's going on? The one thing that has helped, though, is the Internet. Mm -hmm. The disclosure on the Internet, it's, you, you and I can go and look at donations in a way that we couldn't have 20 years ago, and that has had an impact on what people are taking, what money they're taking uh, or not taking. So let me ask you this. New York One uh, was a very innovative step when, uh, when Time Warner uh, started the station up, an all-news television station, reporters covering stuff in the borough, 
shows that you couldn't get the, the broadcast stations uh, to cover uh, if your life depended on it. Talk a little bit about the difference between working for New York One, working for the New York Post, and talk about how the internet has changed New York One in the last few years. Well, I think the internet has changed all the media, that now reporters, especially print reporters, are instantly all wire service reporters. That if you have a great story, you can't wait till 8 o'clock at night and file it. You're filing it at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So you'll have a daily news reporter, a New York Post reporter, Times reporter, and now we're we're, you know, we have to compete with them. Whereas before, we say, "Hey, we get this on the air anytime before it's in the newspaper the next day." That the internet has more have more of an impact on political reporting than anything else. Uh, well, it's a, you know, it's a twenty four hour news cycle now. I remember going to a press conference that Hillary Clinton did on a Friday afternoon at Grand Central, and there were thirty cameras there. Now, it's obviously it's Hillary Clinton, but the fact that it was a Friday afternoon didn't deter her. She knew she was going to get coverage no matter what. It, it is amazing. Uh, it's it's a it's a constantly a moving target. Uh, the, the internet, the, the and, and TV, and, and newspapers. I'm not quite sure how this is all going to shake out in the end. I, I don't know. I, I people say oh, newspapers are dead. Oh, TV is going to be different. I'm not quite sure, especially in New York, where a lot there's a lot of reading on the subways. How, how this is all, all going to end? But you're right. You can hold a news conference out on a Friday now, and, and it will it'll be on the internet all all weekend. So let me so let me ask you this. I go to the New York Post right. uh, webpage, and I will see video clips. And I go to the New York One webpage, and I'll see uh, transcripts of the articles that that uh, of the uh, the pieces that you guys are putting on the air. I can actually read right. what what the anchor has uh, has said. So, at the end of the day, the differentiation is is they're partially distributing a piece of paper. You're partially distributing over over a pipe into my house. Right. But at the end of the day, you're both providing the same product on the internet. Well, that's what they're teaching kids in journalism school now. Hey, you're not you're not a, a TV reporter. You're not a print reporter. You're a content provider. And as disgusting as that title sounds, content provider, it sounds like something George or Orwell would have thought up of. They're right. You can't go to journalism school now. You can't be covering something thinking, oh, I'm only going to write about this, or oh, I'm only going to shoot this for TV. That now you have the New York Times reporters who are carrying little cameras with them, and we have people who have blog entries on, on the web. It, it, it's really amazing how it's all the confluence is there, and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not. Well, and I think a lot of it depends on the credibility of the people who are doing the reporting, and uh, I think New York One is lucky to have somebody that's been around uh, and uh, seen uh, as many of the battles as you have. Well, th thank you, Ken, and I didn't have to pay you to say that, which I appreciate. <laughs> My thanks to New York One political director Bob Hart. I'm Ken Fisher. Thank you for joining us in this edition of Citywide.